Well, good morning or good afternoon or good day, depending on what time zone you're in. I'm delighted to welcome you to this University of Bath School of Management MBA Masterclass entitled Defining Your Career Goals. My name is Donald Lancaster and I'm Director of Teaching for the MBA programmes at Bath. So I'm responsible for the strategic development and departmental oversight of our MBA programmes. And I'm really pleased that so many of you have expressed an interest in studying with us. Just before we start, a little bit of housekeeping, as you'd expect. This meeting is being recorded and you'll notice that your mic and camera are switched off. But may I just point out to you the Q&A button at the middle of the bottom of your screen? Please use it. You can type in at any time any questions you have, either about careers or about Professor Obadora's research or the MBA programmes more widely. And we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions at the end. And of course, at the end, we'll also hear from Becky Gallagher, who is the school's MBA recruitment manager, to whom you can also ask questions via the Q&A function. Probably those questions towards the end will be smart. People join our MBA programmes for diverse reasons, but almost always there's a career related aspect to their quest. And understanding and clarifying your career objectives will help if you decide to continue your application to us. It's, it's not easy to get into the Bath MBA, but by being here, by listening and defining our career goals, you are taking an important and helpful step forwards. So please join me in welcoming Professor Atilia Obadaru to this virtual podium to give us a little taste of the sorts of things that you'd hear in one of her classes. Atilia has a doctorate in organizational behavior from INSEAD. Uh, prior to joining the University of Bath, she was also a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Business School and an assistant professor at Rice University. And her research focuses on how people navigate the contemporary career landscape. And it's sufficiently important that it's been featured in outlets such as Harvard Business Review and the Boston Globe and Forbes and the Huffington Post and the Telegraph. So we're really lucky and appreciative to have you with us today, Atilia. And I, for one, am very excited to hear what you have to say. Over to you. Um, thank you so much, Donald, for that lovely introduction. Um, well, hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Um, I um, am very much appreciate your interest um, and your time, so we're going to jump right in. But just to re reiterate what Donald said, um, the way this is going to work is I'm going to talk for about an hour, which is something I never do in the classroom. <laughs> I don't just lecture for an hour, but um, I'm going to do it here. Um, but of course, um, I would urge you to um, ask any questions that you might have. So as I go through my presentation, um, please write your questions in the Q&A and I will try to answer as many of them as I can um, at the end. Um, because um, I would like to give you a taste for what this class is, but I also want to engage as much as possible with the things that you find interesting or would like to have clarified or you would like more information about. Um, so really, um, I have two goals um, essentially for um, today. Um, first, this is meant to be a taster lecture. So it's meant to give you a taste um, of a particular class that I'm teaching in the MBA program here at Bath. The class is called Defining Your Career Go Goals, um, although originally I wanted to call it uh, Tell Me What You Want, What You Really, Really Want uh, class, uh, not only because I'm a fan of Spice Girls, but also because that does um, actually capture quite well what the class is really about, which is to help the students um, think deeply about what it is that they want to achieve in their careers and how that fits into the bigger picture of, of their uh, what they want out of life uh, more broadly and to be able to articulate those goals in a way that's clear but also um, nuanced and compelling. Um, and so in um, the presentation today, I am going to share with you some of the key ideas and topics and, and themes that we um, we discuss in this class. Um, so you will get a taste um, 
of the content of the class. Unfortunately, you won't really get a taste of the atmosphere um, uh, of the class because, of course, this is a very different format. So if you were taking the class, we would be um, together in person in a classroom, pandemic aside. Um, and the atmosphere is uh, very lively. This is a very interactive course, very much discussion based. Um, in fact, I think one of the strengths of the MBA um, program here at Bath is precisely the relatively small um, class size, which is very conducive to having great um, class discussions. So unfortunately, you won't get a taste uh, for the atmosphere um, of the class, but you will certainly get a taste for um, what the purpose of the class is um, and um, some of the most important ideas that uh, that we cover. Um, my second goal for today related to to that is um, I would like you to get some value um, out of listening to the presentation today, regardless of whether or not um, you decide uh, to pursue an MBA um, here at Bath. Um, obviously, I think that's a great option, but whether or not that's the right option for you, um, since you are investing the time and attention um, in listening to this presentation, I want to make sure that I share with you some of the things that I find most interesting and potentially useful and the things that my students also tend to find really valuable so that hopefully um, you leave today's presentation with some some new ideas that might inform the way you think about your careers. Um, so in, in view of the first goal, um, that of giving you a sense of what this class is about, I want to start um, by just telling you a bit about where the idea for the class originated. Um, because I think that will give you a really good context for understanding what this is and why I think it's important and why I love teaching it. Um, so Daniel did a beautiful job summarizing my academic um, career, but before um, becoming an academic, I worked for a number of years. Um, I worked for about five years in HR consulting, um, mainly involved in recruitment and selection projects. So I was essentially a headhunter um, and I got to interview hundreds of people um, for usually managerial types of positions across the different functions of a company um, in virtually any industry. Um, and it occurred to me early on in this job that this is a great opportunity. At this point, I was still quite young. I was in my 20s. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so I thought, this is great. I can learn uh, from these people uh, who surely must have it all sort of figured out um, because they were by and large older than I was and more advanced in their careers. And they were smart, um, highly educated, ambitious professionals. Um, and so I started, um, in addition to the interview questions that I was supposed to ask them, I started asking them some questions just because I was curious to find out the, the, their answers. Um, questions like, OK, so what do you want to achieve in your careers? What, 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 what is your goal short term, medium term, long term? And why these particular goals? Like, why is this meaningful or important and motivating to you? Um, and how do you define and sort of measure success? How do you know when you've achieved your goals? What has to happen? Who do you have to be or what do you have to own? What has to happen for you to say, I have achieved um, my goals? And what do you think the price is going to be? Success always comes um, at the price. What do you anticipate um, having to pay? And do you already have ideas about what you are willing to pay and what you're not willing to say sacrifice or compromise in order to achieve your goals? Um, and relatedly, how do these career goals sort of fit into um, your other life goals, the other things that, that matter to you? So essentially, I would <laughs> bother these people um, with questions about what do you want? Why do you want it? And how did you figure out um, what you want? Um, now, a pattern um, started emerging really early on in the answers that I was um, hearing. And this pattern was quite surprising and a little more than a little disappointing for me because the pattern was that the vast majority of people didn't really have good answers 
<laughs> to the, the questions I was asking. And um, at the beginning, I was I was surprised, but the more I thought about it and the more I talked to people, the more I realized that my, my expectations were, um, I guess, naive. Um, of course, people don't have it all figured out. Of course, most people um, don't have good answers to these questions, and there are many good reasons uh, for why that is the case. I'm going to outline just two of these reasons. Um, firstly, um, it's not easy to figure out what it is that you want, even within sort of the domain or, or uh, context of, of work and careers, because even within that domain, it's not that we want one thing. We want many things. And in fact, if you look at the research um, on career counseling, you will see the trend loud and clear. Um, over time, our expectations, um, the things we want to get from our careers have increased have consistently increased. And so career counselors today report an increasing difficulty with which people make career decisions, partly because there are really high expectations, right? We don't just want one thing from our careers. We want many things. We want a stable, good job in a good company. We want status. We want money. We want to actually like and enjoy the work that we do. We want it to be meaningful and have an impact, ideally help other people and contribute to society. We want a good work-life balance. Uh, uh, we want many, many things. Um, and the problem is not just that we want many things, but also that some of the things we want are in conflict with each other, right? If you think about it, you'd like to do work that you really love and that you're really passionate about, but that often comes um, at the price that is usually financial stability. Very often, the kinds of jobs that people really love to do and are really passionate about um, are not necessarily well paid. <laughs> or happen to be in industries where there's this winner take all kind of dynamic where very few people can actually make a living and be successful by being say a musician or an actor or whatever that may be right um, or um, we often want to focus on ourselves and develop our own potential and build our careers um, and be sort of self-focused or self-centered which is absolutely normal and we also want to be altruistic and help other people and make the world better. And again, there's a tension there because quite often the things that we do that primarily benefit ourselves are not necessarily the same things that we would do if we wanted to primarily benefit other people, right? Or for another example, we often want to do things our own way. Um, you know, find our own path, take the road less traveled by, be creative and stand out. But we also want to fit in and do something that's a bit more safe and, you know, conform to the rules. We want to um, sort of be a rebel and, and go against what um, our parents might tell us, but we also want our parents to be proud of us. So we want all of these different things. Um, and one of the issues is that very often things that we do to pursue um, one of these goals come in direct conflict with pursuing a different goal which we also want. Um, and this relates to one of the key ideas that um, I'm going to um, talk about today, which is this idea of trade-offs and how do we navigate career trade-offs, which are almost inevitable. Um, so one very good reasons why, uh, reason why people don't always have it all figured out and know exactly what to do and what they want out of their careers is um, th this fact that we want many things and that some of these things are in conflict. Um, but another very good reason is that people don't necessarily have the opportunity to really think about what it is that they want, right? If you think about your own situation and your own experience, um, I'm sure many of you, if not most of you, tend to sort of go with the flow of opportunities. Like you hear about this opportunity, it sounds good to you, someone gives you the advice, you go that way. Um, sometimes you have these moments where you actually think about what it is that you want because for example there's a certain turning point in your career right like you're being offered a job you're interviewing for a job you're given a promotion you're denied a promotion or for whatever reason there's this turning point where you feel the need to sort of stop and assess the situation or because you're having a conversation with a mentor or a friend about your career and you know they're asking you questions and you you sort of have to think 
uh, through and provide some answers. So there's some moments when we actually think a little bit about what it is that we want, but by and large, people don't take a great deal of time to think deeply um, about what is that they want in their careers, right? Like we don't very often um, say, okay, right, I'm going to take a week and during this week, um, every day, for eight hours a day, every day, I'm going to do nothing else but think about what it is that I want in my career, right? And not only am I going to do that, but I'm going to do it in a way that's well structured and organized and guided by questions that are actually important to consider. And not only that, I'm going to do all of that reflection informed by what does research have to say about what it means to have a good career and live a good life, right? Most people don't get that week of guided systematic reflection in terms of what it is that they want. Now, fortunately, um, the MBA students here at Bath <laughs> do get that week <laughs> because that is precisely what this class does. Um, that is what this class is about. Um, this is this is its purpose. Um, and for most students, it works extremely well. Some students and the class being a little bit more confused than they were at the beginning. I like to think that that's just the confusion that already existed, but they weren't aware of it. Um, but for most students, it works really well in terms of helping them push um, towards greater clarity, uh, towards understanding with a bit more depth and a bit more nuance what it is, what is it that they, that they actually care about, um, that actually matters to them and they actually want to do in their careers. Um, all right, so hopefully this provided a little bit more context um, and you now have an idea of what this um, class is about. I'm going to share some slides because that's going to help a bit. Um, with the material that I'm going to cover. All right. So um, just um, in terms of the overall framework um, that I use in order to sort of organize um, the students thinking through um, some of the topics and, and questions that I want them to consider. Um, I use this framework that you see here on the slide um, called the Ikigai. Now, Ikigai is a um, Japanese word um, loosely translates as a reason for being. Um, so it's a Japanese concept that was um, adapted uh, quite a bit and uh, developed into a sort of a career framework. And I, and I quite like it um, because in some ways it's parsimonious um, and clear and straightforward, quite easy to understand. Um, but there's also a lot of depth um, to it. So essentially what the Ikigai framework says is that what you ideally want in terms of your career is to have all of these four components. OK, you would ideally do work that you love. That you are good at. That you can be paid for a reasonable amount and that also allows you to make the kind of positive impact the kind of contribution that you want to make to the world, the ways in which you care about making the world better, right? And so the idea, the fundamental idea of the Ikigai is very straightforward and very simple. Um, you want all of these four things. And the more you have all of these four elements incorporated into your career, the higher the likelihood that you will be happy and satisfied with your career. Now, <clears throat> um, I like the Ikigai framework for many reasons, um, including the fact that it hi highlights these four things that are genuinely important. Um, there's research on careers that would corroborate the fact that all of these four things really tend to matter to most people in most situations. And in fact, it maps strangely well to um, a research on values, which is a field of research that developed entirely separately from this whole idea of the Ikigai and yet reached the same conclusion of these four major values that tend to be important for most people. Um, uh, and this has been validated cross-culturally, so across cultures, these are these are four things, the four things that tend to matter um, a, a great deal. Um, so I like that it highlights the idea that you want all four. I don't particularly like the idea that it says you should get all four 
in your career. And this is an idea that I will return to because I think it's rarely possible. Um, and so you need to know, again, speaking of trade-offs, you need to know how to understand the situations where you don't have all four components uh, at the same time and how to do, how to deal with those situations, right? Um, but I like that it highlights these four elements. It makes it clear that these are four different things and that they're all important. And it's also a really good framework for organizing um, the kinds of topics that I want my students to consider um, as we go through the class and as they ask themselves um, a lot of questions about what it is that they want, right? And so in the presentation today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through each of the four components and I'm going to tell you for each one some of the key ideas that we cover in class and some of the key questions that I ask my students to consider and some of my favorite research findings that I think are relevant and interesting to consider. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm going to sort of bring it all together um, under this umbrella of trade-offs and talk about what happens when you don't have a career that's the bullseye of the Ikigai um, and uh, what to do in those kinds of situations. All right, so um, let's start with the most important component. I'm kidding, of course. Uh, what you can be paid for. Now, the reason I start with this uh, in, in, in the classroom as well um, is because in many ways this is the easiest to tackle. Setting financial goals um, tends to be easier for most people. Um, most people do have an answer to, you know, how much money do you want, even if it's a tentative answer and then we dig a little bit deeper, but it's it's a little bit easier to, to think about. Um, but also because I quite like um, the research that has been done about the link between money and happiness, I think is really interesting, um, very uh, important to consider, and it's the research that I think has examined the most closely um, the relation between a certain component of the Ikigai and happiness. And I think that's important because really fundamentally, when you think about what it is that you want in your career and what you want out of life in general, uh, and you're setting goals, what you're really hoping is that by achieving those goals, you'll be happy. We want to be happy. That's why we're doing pretty much everything we're doing, right? And so the research on the link between money and happiness actually does a beautiful job um, at um, explaining happiness. Um, how do we measure this thing? If we actually want to study happiness, how do you do it? So I think those are important ideas to introduce early on. The questions that I ask my students to consider about this component of the Ikigai are, um, or some of these questions are the following. First of all, how much money do you want? Now here there's flexibility. Some students will express this in terms of um, a certain amount of money they want to have in the bank or savings or investments. Um, some uh, students will think primarily in terms of income and how much they want to earn. I want this kind of salary. So however it makes sense to you, the question is how much money would you would you want? Um, and then the next question, this is a question that's fairly easy, but then the next question comes and it's not as easy. Um, and the question is why that much? Why this particular amount? And this is when it starts becoming a little bit interesting because quite often people will respond by um, talking about very pragmatic, practical things about, well, I want to live in whatever this city, in this country, and this is sort of the cost of living, and I want this kind of house, um, and so I need to buy it or pay rent or whatever it is, and I want to have um, X number of children, or I have X number of children, and they need to go to private. So you have these practical considerations that feed into your ideas about, well, this is how much money I would want or need, right? But the more you spend time with this question of why, and the more you dig a little bit deeper, you will start getting into some more interesting, at least for me, psychological uh, considerations about money, which is what do you hope money is ultimately buying you? Because for many people, money is a proxy. Money is supposed to buy you something that's a value that's much more fundamental and much more important. For some people, it's safety. I feel like if I have a certain amount of money, then I will feel safe. I can live in a safe neighborhood. I can literally feel safe, but I also feel safe because, for instance, growing up, I didn't have a lot of money and I always felt like I'm in a precarious situation. I don't, don't want to experience that um, ever again. 
For other people, it's um, money by status. I want people to look at my car <laughs> and think this is a successful person, right? They want status and admiration and appreciation and those kinds of things, right? For other people, money is primarily about control. Like I want to be able to control as much um, of my life as I possibly can. Like I want control. I want to feel like at any given point, um, I am able to buy myself out of any problem uh, or not have problems at all, if that's <laughs> if that's possible, right? So I think it's really important to dig deeper in terms of um, your financial goals um, and, and try to figure out what it is that you want or hope that money will buy you. Because, um, as I will tell you in a minute, uh, research is pretty clear in terms of telling us that there's some ways to spend money that are better than others in terms of their return on investment, in terms of your well-being and happiness. So some ways to spend money are better, first of all. Um, and some, there are some things that money can't buy. And if you're aware about, uh, of that and realistic about that, uh, then you might save yourself some serious disappointment later on when you realize that you've chased a whole bunch of money, you've reached your goals, but it still didn't buy you that um, as much control as you were hoping or wanting because life is unpredictable and you can't really control much, right? Um, so I ask my students to consider all of these questions, uh, but we also discuss quite a bit the research on, as I was saying, link between uh, money and happiness, right? So um, this research, just like um, uh, research more generally about happiness, talks about two different kinds of happiness. And this is a distinction that I introduced to my students because I, I, I think it's genuinely a good one to have um, and, and to consider and to think about. So one kind of happiness, um, often called hedonic happiness, it's very much about pleasure, experiencing pleasure, pleasant things, having positive emotions, fun, joy, and so on, right? Eating a good meal, um, doing things that you like and enjoy, and you know, so th this is usually the kind of happiness that people tend to think about, at least initially. But there's another kind of happiness that's also important, um, often called eudaimonic happiness, which is much more about having a sense of meaning or purpose in your life, right? So if you want another way to, to think of um, these two kinds of happiness, the hedonic pleasure-based kind of happiness is about being happy in your life. You're living your life daily and you're experiencing a lot of joy and a lot of positive emotions, right? You're being happy in your life. Now, the eudaimonic meaning-based kind of happiness is much more about you take a step back and you look at your life and you're happy with your life. You think, I've lived a good life. This, this is good, I'm happy, I'm satisfied with it, right? So these are very different and it's quite interesting um, to realize like fully this distinction I think comes into focus when you realize that there are situations where um, they don't correlate all that well. <laughs> the correlation between these two kinds of happiness is not as strong as you would think. And there are situations where you see it really clearly. For example, um, there's uh, fascinating research on parenting and parents and the comparison between people who have children and people who do not have children. Um, so during the time when the children are still small or even teenagers, but they're in the house living with the parents, um, Generally speaking, parents will report a significantly lower level of the hedonic pleasure-based happiness uh, compared to uh, people who don't have children, right? But they will also report a significantly greater level of the eudaimonic meaning purpose-based kind of happiness compared to um, people who don't have children, right? So sometimes, you, sometimes you'll experience situations when you feel puzzled because you are sort of happy, but not really. It might just be that the, this distinction is at play there where you're experiencing one kind of happiness, but not the other, right? And so when researchers um, try to study happiness, uh, the best studies will take this distinction into account and they will measure both kinds of happiness. So usually the hedonic pleasure-based kind of happiness is labeled, um, you will see it in uh, research studies called um, emotional well-being. Usually that's the label. And it's measured by simply asking people to report 
how frequently and how intensely they've experienced positive versus negative emotions over the past day, days, weeks, however, uh, whatever you're measuring in that particular study. Um, whereas the um, meaning-based kind of happiness is usually called life evaluation and is usually measured in research by asking people uh, about their sort of overall thoughts, evaluative thoughts about, again, as I said earlier, if you take a step back and look at your life, how satisfied, how happy, how meaningful do you find it, right? So you ask people different questions and therefore measure uh, differently these different kinds of happiness. And then, of course, you can see whether these measures of happiness correlate with a number of things that you might care about, including how much money do people have? Um, if you're curious to figure out, well, does money buy happiness? Does more money make you happier? Now, one of the most reported um, and sadly misreported uh, findings um, from this literature is this notion that money doesn't buy happiness that money buys you out of unhappiness. So it's important to have a certain threshold of, you know, good enough, because if you're poor and you don't have money, that will certainly buy you a lot of unhappiness, right? So the lack of money certainly has an impact, right? But the moment you reach a certain threshold of money or income or whatever it is, um, and that the threshold that's talked about is around $75,000 uh, in annual income, so the moment you reach that threshold of good enough, what's good enough for most people, more money does not buy you more happiness. So you see a plateau in happiness. Money can go up, but happiness doesn't. Right. So this is a, um, this is a finding that's very widely uh, widely reported, and I'm sure many, if not most, of you have heard this in some form or another because I have seen it literally everywhere. It's in articles in the media and blogs and podcasts and interviews and on TV and I've um, even seen it on several TV shows, successful ones. Um, now every time that gets reported it makes me a little bit sad um, because I know that that's really really not the whole story and this is why I, I want my students to know the whole story because I think it's important to, to look at the details and the nuance, right? This finding is based on a classic study um, that was done by Daniel Kahneman and um, Angus Deaton. These are um, um, extremely good researchers, uh, pr pretty much as good as it gets. Um, in fact, they both, I'm pretty sure, won the Nobel Prize in economics, which is even more impressive in the case of Daniel Kahneman, who is actually a psychologist and still managed to win a Nobel Prize in economics, right? So. Um, Undoubtedly, this study is a classic for a reason. It is really well done. It's not a perfect study by any means, but it is a survey of a large uh, US sample of the population where they essentially looked at um, these two measures of happiness and they also looked at people's income. Um, so annual income, right? Um, and what they found was indeed that emotional well-being, that hedonic pleasure, positive emotions um, type of happiness does rise with income but plateaus. So income goes up, emotional well-being goes up, but only up until around $75,000 yearly income. And then income keeps going up, but emotional well-being doesn't. It plateaus. Right. So this is the finding that gets reported widely to say money doesn't buy happiness because for some reason I think people really like that idea. Now what doesn't get reported is the other half of the findings, um, which is that the other measure of happiness, the meaning purpose based life evaluation keeps rising. There is no plateau. They don't find any threshold there, <laughs> right? So. This is enough already to tell you that the relationship between money and happiness is a bit more complicated than, um, you know, money doesn't buy happiness and that's it. There's definitely more going on. Um, the story is a little bit more, more complex. Um, not only that, um, if you look since 2010, of course, there have been um, a number of other studies, some of them with bit bigger samples that are international, some of them with even be better measures of, of both income and happiness, um, some of which have replicated this finding to some extent, as in they have found some threshold um, of income beyond which happiness doesn't, doesn't um, increase as much. But 
um, they have also found that that threshold varies a great deal depending on who you are and where you live and um, uh, cost of living in your area and who's your peer group that you compare yourself to. So it varies quite a bit. You can't just take, um, you know, an amount and say, yeah, that, 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 that's going to work for everybody. I um, heard a few years back there was a CEO of a company who took the 75,000 um, really at face value and made everybody's salary in the company 75,000, which made some people really unhappy and they quit. So it's not about taking a threshold um, and thinking, well, you know, um, th th this is it, like beyond that, there's nothing to do with money, but it's more complicated than that. And in fact, there are um, many studies, including one that was published recently, I think it was last year in the same journal where Kahneman and Deaton uh, originally published this study um, that again looked at happiness and income and um, didn't find any threshold, any plateauing of any kind, happiness kept going up, right? Um, and so when you hear this finding now about how oh research shows that money doesn't buy you happiness, hopefully now you'll know better. Uh, it's really not quite that simple. Um, and so I um, one of the things that I tell my students um, is not only the relationship with money, with, between happiness and money is more complicated, and it's worth really thinking through what it means for yourself. Again, what you hope money can buy you. Um, but it is also worth considering that one of the possible reasons why um, the relationship between money and happiness is complex is because it depends on what you do with the money. Like greatly depends what you do with the money, right? And so there is a lot of research, for instance, showing that, um, as I mentioned earlier, some ways of spending money are um, better than others. <laughs> um, in that um, if people spend um, the same amount of money, but on experiences rather than things, possessions, or um, purchasing things for other people rather than for themselves, or uh, spending money so that it buys them time, out of say doing tasks that they really don't like to do. These are kinds of things that have a better return on, on investment in terms of happiness and well-being. Um, so th there, there's ways to think about not just how much money you want to make when you set your career goals, but also think a little bit deeper in terms of what you want to do with that money. Um, all right, so I hope that made sense. Let's move on to the next component um, of the Ikigai, which is ideally you want to do work that you love. <clears throat> now, some of the questions that um, I ask my students to consider um, is, of course, think about what are the things that they really love to do. Uh, it's important to have that like really clear, especially in terms of clarifying what you authentically love to do, because I feel like quite often, um, there's a potential confusion of um, I want to love this. I think I should love these things. I think these things are worthwhile loving, but I don't really love them. I give my students a somewhat silly example, but um, I think it illustrates it. Um, for the longest time, I really, really wanted to love classical music. Because for some reason, I had this idea in my head that people who like classical music are, I don't know, smarter or more cultured or whatever it was, right? And so I forced myself to listen to classical music and it colored my impressions of, of people. I would meet someone and they um, told me about like they like or play classical music and immediately I would like them more. And um, so, so this was a theme for me. I really, really uh, wanted to love classical music, but I really don't. No disrespect to anybody who loves classical music, um, but the point is sometimes, sometimes we think inauthenticity comes because we let other people's voices drown out our own inner voice. And it's true that there's a lot of, um, you know, cultural messages we get uh, and messages from people in authority position and uh, positions in our life um, that we sort of internalize and then it becomes harder to figure out what you authentically like and what you authentically want. But sometimes inauthenticity comes actually from the inside. You want to be the kind of person who wants these things, but you don't really want those things. And so I push my students gently, but I push them to really think um, whether their activities or things that they truly like, truly get joy out of, um, authentically so. Um, and then 
the next question would be, OK, would you want to include more of these things in your career going forward? Have you included some of these things in your career so far? And do you want to include them when you set your career goals? But when you do, um, if you do want to include the things you love in your career, there are some other questions that you might consider. Like, for example, if you do what you love as a job, will you still love it? It is a valid question because doing what you love for the sake of just doing and the joy that you get out of, of that activity is very different. It's what um, psychologists call intrinsic motivation. Now, when you do that as a job, there's a lot of extrinsic motivation factors that come into play, right? You're doing it for the purpose of finishing a project, making a client happy, you have bosses, you have deadlines. There's a lot of other dynamics that get involved. And we know from decades and decades of research that when you start mixing extrinsic, ex extrinsic motivation factors, um, it tends to not work well for intrinsic motivation. And so it does happen sometimes that people do what they love and they think, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is my calling. But then when they actually do it as a job, they realize it's quite different. Um, I have interviewed for my own research a number of people who have told me explicitly, I don't want to do what I love um, as a career because I know it's going to taint it. I know I'm not going to love it quite as much. So just to tie it back to what I was saying earlier, I love the Ikigai as a framework, but the idea that you'll get all four things in your career will not necessarily work for everybody. So um, I invite my students to think a bit more broadly about how you get all those four components. Um, right, um, another really good question to ask when you talk about things that you love is, if you want to do it um, as a career, are you willing to pay the price? Um, very often, as I was saying earlier, when you do the things that you love, there's a price to pay for it um, because quite often, the domains where you find most often people intrinsically motivated in their work are also not the domains that are the most well paid. <laughs> so the myth of the starving artist, for example, is unfortunately not a myth. It's uh, corroborated by a mountain of research that shows that people in creative artistic professions are severely underpaid and they tend to work in highly precarious kinds of, of, of jobs. Um, all right, so I, I, you know, if you're willing to pay the price um, and, and this, this is what you want, that's fine. But be aware, speaking of trade-offs, and know how to deal with the consequences of, of um, having made those trade-offs. And finally, another question that I uh, ask my students to consider when we talk about this component of the Ikigai is, are you good at it? <laughs> Which is a tough question to ask people, um, but I think it's an important one because if it's something that you genuinely love, you very much want to believe that you're good at it. But as the Ikigai makes clear, these are two separate, different components. They're different things, right? Um, there might be some correlation there. It would make sense, right? Um, if, if you really love something, uh, you enjoy doing it, presumably you'll do it more and so you become better at it, right? Um, there might be a correlation the other way where if you're really good at something, you get praised, you get a lot of positive feedback, so you might start enjoying it. So there might be a relation between these two things, but they are not the same. And there are many situations when the overlap is not going to be as, as, as big as you would think or you would hope. Um, and so this is an idea that I think is worth considering and worth remembering um, because it's also, one of those situations that is psychologically hard to handle for people. Um, if you, I'm sure for those of you who really love doing something that you're not great at, you will understand what I mean. It's not a comfortable, um, uh, you know, situation to be in when you'd like to be great at it, um, but you know you're not. Um, and so you keep doing what you love just because you enjoy it and that's fine, but you know that you're not good at the point where um, you would say be among the top 1% in the world uh, or whatever it would take for you to be really successful, right? And in fact, the other mirror image situation is also really difficult to handle the situation when you're really good at something that you don't love. Um, people get really uncomfortable and puzzled by that situation. One of um, my favorite illustrations of that is um, um, 
Andre uh, Agassi, uh, who is one of the best tennis players um, of all time, he also wrote one of my favorite autobiographies of all time. It's really beautiful. It's a book called, um, nicely called Open. Um, and in his autobiography, the main key theme that he explores and tries to deal with uh, is the realization that he is undoubtedly good at tennis. He's one of the best tennis players, you know, in the world. Um, so he's clearly good at that. Uh, but he really, really hated tennis. He hated tennis. So it's not even that you don't love it. That he really hated tennis. Um, and so, again, these are not comfortable situations to be in, but they're extremely important to diagnose and understand really well so that you don't don't get caught in weird traps um, in terms of um, setting goals about what it is that you want to do. Um, OK, let's move on to the third component of the Ikigai. Um, which is, we are just talking about that, what, what you're good at. Um, and so here I ask my students to consider, again, a number of questions. Um, I ask them to really think and list um, all of the things that they think they're really good at. I, I, I ask them to be really exhaustive, like write down everything you can think of that you think you, you know, you're good at. And then we go through the list. Um, and to think about this particular distinction that I think is quite important to consider, which is how many things on your list are things that you're naturally good at? You would say you have a natural aptitude, ability, you have a talent for it, you've always had a talent for it. And how many of the things on that list are things that you just worked really hard to develop? Right. Sometimes it's both, but quite often um, people are easily able to identify. Yeah, this is something I've always had. Like I know I have like this is a natural strength, a natural talent I have. And this is I worked years and years and years. It took me to to get to this level where I am. Right. Um, I think this this distinction between talent and hard work is uh, is one of the key um, ideas worth considering about this component of the Ikigai. Um, and it relates to another idea that I find a lot of people have, um, when I was teaching in the US, virtually everybody had that idea, um, this belief that if you work hard enough, you can be anything and you can do anything, that extreme agency um, kind of belief. Um, and so for many people, that is a fundamental belief. Uh, you know, it really lays at the foundation of how they set career goals. Um, and I think it's an important belief to really look at carefully because, again, um, it can be intensely motivating, um, but it can also be a, a um, horrendous trap. Um, um, if you if you don't um, if you don't succeed, because a lot of things are not under our control. A lot of the times, even if you hurt, work extremely hard, you're not going to get what you want. And so dealing with these situations when you have this belief um, is really, really tricky, right? And so um, I asked my students to really consider, and we talk a lot about the research um, around this distinction between um, how do you get good at something? You know, we all know it's both being talented and working hard, right? Like you need both by and large. But many people have a clear belief about which one matters more. So, for example, for the people who really believe that if you work hard enough, you can do anything, clearly they buy into hard work is more important, right? Practice makes perfect. We hear this over and over, right? And so you see cultural messages abound about this particular idea, um, most notably this idea of the, the recipe for greatness, right? Like if you put in 10,000 hours, of hard work, deliberate practice on something, you can become not just good, world class good. You can become a master at something, right? Um, uh, so this idea was, I think it became really popular because of Malcolm Gladwell's book, um, Outliers, where he talked about how there's research in a variety of different contexts from sports to chess to music to wherever you look in terms of performance, world class performance. Um, it took at least 10,000 hours of practice for people to get to that level, right? And so this idea just caught on like wildfire because people really like to believe the notion of, well, if I just work hard enough, right? Um, there's by now a lot of research to 
debunk that idea and to show the very many ways in which it does not work. And it is absolutely not a recipe for greatness in any way. Um, you can think of it maybe as an average in terms of the number of hours that it might take, but that average also comes with a great variance. So there are people who become grandmasters playing chess in 4,000 hours, and there, it, it, there are people for whom it takes 20,000 hours. So the variance is so, so big that it just becomes not as useful to take the 10,000 hours really as a recipe for anything. Um, even Malcolm Gladwell himself, a few years back, I remember he came out with an um, article in the New Yorker saying, hey, everybody calm down. <laughs> I didn't mean this to be a recipe. The situation is way more complicated. The research I was talking about was already assuming and looking at people who are enormously naturally talented. And then they build on top of that um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, thousands of hours of, of hard work, right? So it's, it's more, more complicated. Um, you also get um, cultural messages that are a bit less loud. Um, I guess people don't like them quite as much. On the other side um, of the spectrum, right, about how really all that matters or what really matters most is talent. Um, so you have books like um, David Epstein's um, uh, the Sports Gene, uh, which is a great book, by the way, and if you read it carefully, you'll see he go goes into a lot of nuance, right? But um, there's this idea of like really what matters is your natural ability, and you see it as especially in a, in a domain like sports. You see it super, super clearly. Um, you can work hard as, and practice as much as you want, and it will it will get you to be better, but it might never get you to be world class because you're not tall enough or you're not built uh, in a certain way, right? It's just as simple as that. And so I invite my students to really consider um, their strengths um, and to consider the way they relate to this idea of what matters to me is working with my strengths and developing my talents, uh, working really, really hard because I think that if I work hard enough, I can believe uh, everything. So we explore this distinction quite a bit. Um, and I do ask them to consider um, working with their natural talents as much as possible, as much as possible. Um, there's a lot of career advice that we hear um, that centers around other components of the Ikigai. For example, we hear a lot the advice around follow your passion, do something that you love, uh, or you hear the more pragmatic kind of advice, advice like do the job that's safe and pays the mortgage and gives you however much money um, uh, you want. We don't as often, I feel, hear the advice of really develop your strengths. Um, and I think that's actually possibly even better um, advice. So work with your natural abilities as much as possible and try to develop those as much as possible. Um, ideally informed by research in terms of when does hard work actually make a difference and actually matters? Um, because research is quite informative uh, on that front. There are domains in which working hard makes much of a bigger impact um, and other domains where it doesn't. So for example, um, a few years back, there was a meta-analysis published, which is a study of studies. So it's not just one study, it looks at a field of research overall. This one looked at um, over a hundred different studies um, uh, that's, that looked at um, the impact of hard work and practice on performance across a variety of domains. So we're talking sports, music, but also like professional life, education. Um, and so one of the things that they realized is that, again, the impact of hard work on performance varies quite a bit. So in a lot of domains that relate to professional life and education, it matters very little to the tune of between one and 5%. So it's, it, it doesn't explain a lot of the variance in performance. And there are other domains um, like sports, for example, where it matters significantly more um, to the tune of, it's still not a lot, it's somewhere between 20 and 30%. So it's still less than you would think, but it's definitely more, right? Um, and they also found that one factor that seems to matter across domains is the degree to which the task environment is predictable or not, right? So if you're trying to become good at something that is relatively predictable, then it makes sense to put in a lot of practice and a lot of hard work, right? Like think of, I don't know, a sport like um, say running, 
right? It's fairly predictable. The task environment doesn't change much as you're doing the task, right? You're just running and there's not many unpredictable things that are going to happen. But then think of something like, say, uh, piloting a plane, you know, aviation. There is a million things that can happen and there's literally no way to prepare for every single scenario, right? Um, and so, of course, you need to practice. Of course, you need to work hard and learn everything you're supposed to learn. But again, the impact um, that hard work does is, is quite different. I think it's important to know these things because it can guide you um, to make decisions about where to put your time and effort um, and attention in developing, right? Um, and then finally, let me just quickly check how much time we have. OK, we're doing good. Um, <clears throat> so finally, the last um, component of the Ikigai um, that we discuss is this idea of um, what kind of impact do you want to have? What kind of contribution do you want to make um, to the world? It, it, sometimes it's not the world. It's not as grandiose as that. People care about the impact um, on their family, their loved ones, their community. But it's fundamentally about the way in which you want what you do um, to make a positive contribution, to do something that's good outside of yourself for like other people, for your community, for the world at large, for society, for whatever it is, right? Um, these, uh, this component of the Ikigai actually becomes more important as people age. Uh, generally speaking, uh, so on, on average um, and actually saw it. I taught this class to um, undergraduates, uh, master students, MBA students and executive MBA students. And when I teach this to executives, they always really resonate with this component significantly more and they want to talk about it significantly more. Um, but so the kinds of questions that I ask my students to consider um, are the following. First of all, to look at the sort of subjective side of things of what kind of positive impact is meaningful to you and why is that meaningful, right? And again, it might be um, the kind of positive impact I think I can have and I want to have it as more meaningful to me is to be a good parent. I think if the world had really good parents, we would all be much, much better off. So this is where I'm going to focus in terms of making a contribution. OK, this is where my legacy is. And then you have at the other end of the spectrum, people who think much more on a global scale, like I actually want my work to matter in terms of making a positive contribution and make the world better in a substantial sort of a way. Right. So I ask my students to consider for themselves what it is that they care about, what's the impact that they want to have and why is that particularly meaningful for them? But then I also ask them to consider the more objective side of the equation, which is what is the most effective impact that you can have? Um, and here I introduce my students to what is one of the best ideas that I have ever heard. Um, I was and still am extremely happy that this exists in the, in the world, the idea of effective altruism. Um, so this is a philosophy and also a social movement um, that's centered around the idea um, of using evidence and reasoning um, in, in determining where um, uh, the kind of impact that you want to have, right? Including, for example, donating to charities, right? And so it's the idea of like you want to do good, which is great. How can you do so in the most effective way possible? There are many people who would want to have a positive impact and would want to say, for example, donate to charities, right? Um, but they feel sort of unsure about how to go about it. How do I know that the money I donate, for example, is really put to good use? Uh, how do I know, and not just to good use, to the best possible use, right? Um, and so I introduced my students to, some of them already know about this, um, um, to this idea of, of effective altruism and this notion of putting together uh, their subjective understanding of what's meaningful to them in terms of the impact they want to make with this more objective understanding of right how do i do that in the most effective way possible um, i think this is a really important idea because it helps us it, it works against some of our biases um, that we have that tend to often cloud our moral judgments quite a bit. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard this um, saying of um, 
uh, a million, uh, how is it? One death is a tragedy and million deaths is a statistic. We have a lot of biases that are built in, um, in the way we look at the world where, um, for example, if um, we find out about this one child and we find out her name and we see her picture, we're much more likely to get invested emotionally and therefore donate and want to help. Um, if we hear about a thousand children who are in the similar situation, we sort of get overwhelmed and we distance ourselves and we're not as likely to to want to help, which is profoundly counterintuitive, right? You, you should ideally want to help even more. So our moral intuitions are um, biased in predictable ways that have been well studied by research. Um, and so I think this idea of effective altruism is great at working against those biases. Um, and um, for many people, um, they embrace this idea in a way that um, just maps on to what it is that already want to do in terms of impact, and they just focus on doing it better. So for example, you've been thinking for a while of um, donating a part of your income to charity, but you didn't know exactly how to go about it. Well, okay, um, you can then hear about effective altruism. You can hear about organizations like GiveWell um, that just studies charities and tells you where your money would do the most good. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who resonate with this idea profoundly and let this be um, sort of a um, guiding force behind their career decisions. Um, I was recent, uh, listening recently to um, an interview with Sam Bankwell Freed, who um, is a founder and CEO of FTX. This is a cryptocurrency um, exchange and um, quite likely the youngest self-made billionaire. He's, I'm pretty sure, still under 30. Um, and the key idea behind his career decision, uh, uh, his decision of what to do with his career was, he said, I wanted to use my strengths to make the most money I can make so that I can donate the most money I can donate. Right, so you, you can be anywhere along this spectrum, but I think there's a way to consider this component of the Ikigai, again, not just from the subjective sense of this is the kind of impact that's meaningful to me, but also this is the kind of impact that I can make um, in an effective sort of a way. All right, so to borrow from uh, <laughs> Um, Will McCaskill is one of the uh, founders of Effective Altruism um, and he wrote a wonderful uh, book called Doing Good Better and so I um, try to copy him a little bit and encourage my students <laughs> to do good but do it better. Um, so these are the four components um, uh, of the Ikigai and this is um, sort of the structure of um, the first portion of the class where we go through each component and I ask my students to consider a lot of questions so that they can go deeper into their thinking about what it is that um, that they want. Um, but again, I also try to encourage them to be a little bit more flexible in their understanding of whether or not it's possible for them to get all four things in their career because that for many people is not necessarily possible and for some people, it's not necessarily even desirable. As I was saying earlier, for some people, uh, doing what you love as part of your work is not optimal. So ideally, you want these four components of the Ikigai. You don't necessarily have to have all of them at the same time from your career. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this is actually quite difficult and quite rare, partly because if you look at the Ikigai, you will notice that two of the components, doing what you love and doing good in the world, are much more idealistic types of values, as opposed to making money and doing something that you're good at, which are much more pragmatic. And quite often, as I was saying, idealistic and pragmatic values are in conflict, such that pursuing one usually comes at the cost of the other, right? So this is the case for most people. Um, I would say, and there's some research to support um, uh, that idea. I want to give you an illustration. I'm sure um, by now you, you already um, have an idea of what it is that I'm trying to say. I'm just going to give you an illustration based on my own research. So these are two people that I interviewed for my own research. Um, the first one took a more sort of idealistic career path. This is a person who is a professional musician. He's a bass player. He started touring right out of high school and he says very clearly, I love what I do, right? But 
There isn't a day I don't think about what my life would be like if I had pursued school instead of music. I could be making money, have a strong relationship, have my own home, the more stable, secure path with financial security and all of that kind of stuff. Now, this is not that he's regretting his decision. This is not about regret. OK, this is about how do you deal with the fact that you want both? You want both the idealistic kinds of values that matter to you and the pragmatic values that matter to you. You want both and often you can't actually have both, right? And here's the mirror image of that. Someone I interviewed who took the more pragmatic type of career path. Um, she said, um, I started dancing at age three, playing piano at age four, singing at age three and outside of school. That's pretty much all I did growing up. She was very serious about music. She even interviewed for the Mickey Mouse Club where Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears came from, for those of you who know, <laughs> um, who know pop music. Um, but of course, there came a point where the parents said, no, 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 this is, um, there are very many people who can make a living out of this. This is really precarious. Don't do that. Get the real job. Grow up, get the real job, do something practical with your life. And so um, she did. And when I interviewed her, she was actually doing a, a PhD and becoming an academic. Um, but she also talked about how she still sings um, to herself, but she still sings. She still loves music. That's still a part of her life, right? Um, because again, we want both things. We want many things. We want things that conflict with each other, right? The problem is most of the time we can't really have all of the things, uh, certainly not all of them from our career, right? Um, and so I guess one of my key messages, one of the key ideas that I would like you to consider for today um, is this notion that almost everything you do, almost every career path that you take is likely to imply a trade off, is likely to give you some of the things that we talked about in the Ikigai framework, but not other things. Right? This is a common situation. And I really would like people to be better prepared for it. I feel like very often, when we give career advice, it's very, it's very focused on making the right career choice, right? You have career counselors, they give you personality tests. What is the right career decision for you? And people agonize over, should I do this? Should I do the other? Should I take this job offer? Should I take the other offer? Because there's a hidden assumption there that if, if only I make the right choice, the right choice, then everything will be fine. Right, everything would be fine. I would be happy. There would be birds chirping on my shoulder and possibly a unicorn in the corner of the office and everything will resolve itself, right? But the problem is, again, almost regardless of what decision you make, it's not so much the career path you're taking, but the way you travel down that path and what you get out of it, right? And almost every career path that you end up deciding on will have some trade-offs and so it really matters that you're prepared for that. It really matters that you understand what these trade-offs, like what they really are and frame them well and that you know what to do about them, right? And so what I would argue is that the way to understand this idea of trade-offs, of situations where you can't have everything you want in your career is simply that there's some values that you're not getting in your career. So you want the we want more of them. You're missing, you know, those particular values and you just the way to deal with that is just find a way to be flexible and creative and find ways to fulfill those missing values. OK, now that is a very different perspective. To take about trade offs, right? It's not about you find yourself thinking about, oh, I wish, you know, I would be a musician right now. You don't frame it as, oh, I regret my career decisions. I should have stuck with music. I should have had the courage to pursue my passion. But rather you think of it in terms of, well, I also wanted money and stability and that's good too, but clearly I'm missing music. So what are some of the ways in which I could include more of that in my life? That is a very different perspective to take. Um, and it's a perspective that usually tends to be more calm and tends to be better in terms of helping you um, uh, get more out of life rather than um, more of the freak out regret I made the wrong decision what is happening um, kind of perspective. So
This is going to be my last slide because I'm just going to walk you quickly through some of the things that people do to fulfill missing values, right? So you find yourself in a situation where you don't get all of the values that you want. You don't have the bullseye of the Ikigai in terms of your career. And so there are some values that you're missing or you want more of. So what can you do about that? There's plenty of things that you can do. This is not even necessarily an exhaustive list, um, but it can um, help you to think through uh, possibilities. So for one thing, you can do something that research calls job crafting, meaning you simply try to include some of the things that um, um, you're missing, some of the values that you're missing into your current job. And if you have autonomy, um, then you can use it wisely. If you have autonomy in your job, you should use it wisely, right? Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is a professor I know who um, um, really wanted to be a, a piano player, a musician. Uh, and so at some point he literally brought a piano in the classroom. He convinced the university to bring a piano in, in the classroom so that whenever he made a point that he particularly liked, he would just play a little bit on the piano. There's a way to include um, more of, say, what you love in your current job. Many, many people, of course, we all know this, um, do activities that fulfill missing values as a hobby. You don't get to do it in your work time, that's fine. You can do it in your leisure time. And again, for some people, sometimes that actually works even better. Um, because, for instance, you might, in fact, want to do activities that you love as a hobby rather than as a career, as we talked earlier. Um, another way, which we also touched on a little bit, is use money wisely. Use money to buy you, say, time to do some of the activities that you want to do and that fulfill um, values that you are missing or want more of. Um, one thing that my MBA students do a lot of, um, when I was teaching in the US, virtually every MBA student I taught had a, a story that was something like this. I will first work in insert whatever consulting, investment, banking, um, energy, whatever other sectors were popular, make my X insert number of millions of dollars that you wanted to make, and then I'm going to do what I really love, start my entrepreneurial venture, uh, go to Africa and do my nonprofit organization and so on and so forth. So postponing, working with sort of sequential career planning um, is something that people do quite often um, and it often works really well. Sometimes it doesn't because if you spend 10 years being a consultant, investment banker and so on and so forth, uh, there's things that <laughs> change at the end of that. You won't necessarily be quite the same person as uh, as you were before, but for some people it does work. Um, a more interesting way to experience a missing value is, vi value is vicariously. And there's a lot of research on vicarious experience that essentially says, especially with close others, we take them to be part of our sense of self. And so their experiences to some extent become our experiences, um, which to me puts an interesting spin on this notion of opposites attract. And you see couples where literally uh, one is living uh, what they're missing through the other. <laughs> Um, and sometimes you see a similar dynamic with parents and children where parents are trying to live vicariously through their children, some of the values that they're missing uh, or want more of. And this is a really tricky, uh, difficult dynamic to navigate. And finally, another slightly strange uh, sort of strategy to fulfill a missing value and deal with the trade off is to fantasize and daydream about it. Which again, I know it sounds odd, but there is a mountain of research on mental simulations that shows that at some level to oversimplify things a bit, our brain can't quite tell the difference between activities that are executed in real life and activities that are fantasized about. Which explains, for instance, um, in sports psychology, there's an entire uh, field of research on mental training where athletes train in their mind, in their imagination alone. There's no overt physical movement of any kind, and yet they experience a lot of, uh, of gains in terms of performance. Um, and so daydreaming about um, doing some of the things that you know, you're missing, being the kind of person that you can't get to experience being in your real life, actually at least to some extent feeds um, uh, the, the missing value a bit. I know it is a strange one, but believe me when I tell you, it really does work. <laughs> so when nothing else works, when everything else fails, you don't have autonomy you don't, in your job, um, you don't have time to uh, do hobbies, um, you don't have any of the other possibilities, there's always daydreaming. Um, so 
I hope this gave everyone a bit of um, a taste for the content of this class and some of the ideas that, that, that we cover and some of the questions that I ask my students and some of the research um, that we go through. I'm going to end here because I've already talked more than I was planning to, but that tends to happen when I talk about things I like. Sorry. So why don't I stop the slide sharing and we can go through any questions. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a really fascinating, both an introduction to, to your course, but also uh, stimulating even my interest in taking the course. And I'm sure all of our audience <laughs> are fascinated. You are and welcome to take the class <laughs> if you want to. I'm more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a lot of sanguine advice in there as well. So, so really, really helpful. Um, there are there are some questions, so okay. maybe we can we can look at some of these. Um, that's good. Um, the, one of the first questions that came in was a question saying, are there any things about the Ikigai framework that you do not like and mm -hmm. perhaps things that it doesn't capture well or misinterprets or whatever? Right. Yeah, it's not. There's no such thing as a perfect framework, obviously. Um, so yeah, th there's um, one of the things I think I already mentioned, which is this idea that um, the advice that gets based on the Ikigai framework is that you should try to get all four things in your career all at the same time. Um, and again, my, my my problem with that is that for most people, that's not that's simply not possible. Um, and sometimes not even desirable, right? And so um, I would definitely relax that idea and make the guy broader and not just about careers, but rather about your life overall. Um, and also I would say, you know, it captures these four elements that do tend to be important to most people most of the time. Um, but that's not to say that, that that's all that matters to people, right? There's always going to be things that uh, matter that are not necessarily captured. They're quite Actually, recently in um, the latest um, MBA cohort that I taught, there was a student who said, I used to have a job that was in the bullseye of the Ikigai for me, and I still quit the job. Uh, because there was one thing that's not captured in the Ikigai, but that was extremely important, which is um, he was very sort of not in geographical control over his life. So the job demanded that he move to certain places at certain times, and there was no flexibility about it. And so, of course, that has a trickle down effect um, uh, of all sorts in terms of um, the rest of your life and your family and all sorts of things. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it is not perfect and it doesn't capture um, everything, but I find it to be a useful tool to sort of structure the class and organize, um, you know, our discussions um, and, the, and the questions um, that we go through. Absolutely, yeah, and and I guess for most people, most of the time, it's it's a paradox that can't really be resolved, which makes it interesting and fascinating. Right. And actually, I, I empathise with that student. I was in a similar position myself. Mm. But, and partly that leads into another question that we've got here, which is, do you have any thoughts on how to deal with a dual career situation? In mm -hmm. other words, where you're having to coordinate <laughs> right. career goals with your partner's career goals, or trying to live two lives con conjunctively. And in my right. case traveling a lot but wanting to be at home you know all that sort of stuff right yeah that's it is as i was saying hard enough to figure out what you want in your career but then trying to figure out what you want and what your partner wants and how to work both uh, of those things um it's quite difficult um i did do um, a research project on dual careers um, uh, with a good friend of mine, Jennifer Petrilieri, um, who is a professor at INSEAD. Um, and we published an academic uh, paper out of it, and then uh, Jennifer went on to do even more research and published a book, which I highly recommend. So for those of you who are in this kind of uh, situation where you have a dual career, um, you have two careers that you care about uh, and you need to coordinate, um, so Jennifer Petrilieri and her book um, uh, is called Couples That Work. I highly recommend it. It's extremely good um, and full of really good advice in terms of how do you navigate? How do you figure out how to, uh, you know, coordinate two careers that matter uh, to the two, the two people? Um, one of the things that I can tell you, though, uh, based on this research um, is that what we found is that um, there are couples that have a specific arrangement whereby one career is more important than the other. 
right? So there's one spouse whose career is um, takes priority, is the number one career, right? And so that dictates pretty much everything that happens. All of the decisions that they make together as a couple take into account this idea that one person's career is the one that matters more, and this is where we're going to invest a lot of um, our resources, and this is where uh, our, our decisions are going to tilt towards favoring that person's career. Um, um, and then there's the other kind of arrangement that couples can have, which is both our careers are important. We're going to focus on both at the same time, and they see it much more as a mutual benefit type of arrangement, right? So whereas the first arrangement comes much more with the rhetoric of, which is what you normally find in the media, the rhetoric of, um, well, sacrifices and compromises and give and take. The second kind of arrangement comes much more with the language of positive synergies. I can achieve and be significantly more because my partner is also doing their thing in their career and we feed off of each other's success and we encourage and we're a platform for the other. Um, and so we can achieve significantly more together than we would have achieved on our own. So it's a very different perspective um, uh, with which they look at what it means to be a dual career couple. Now, initially both Jennifer and I thought um, it's very hard to sort of not filter your own ideas and opinions into your own research. We try very hard, but it's, 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 it's really difficult, right? And so we initially thought, surely the second kind of arrangement is quote unquote better, right? It's better when both people have equal, you know, importance placed on their career and they see each other as equal partners and they each get to, you know, they both get to explore and grow and develop as much as they want to in their career without one taking priority. Now, the interesting thing is that's not necessarily true. Right, we, we we thought that we're going to see um, these kinds of couples being, I don't know, more uh, not just more successful in their careers, but also more satisfied in terms of their um, you know relationship and all of that. And that's not necessarily true because the same arrangement doesn't necessarily work for all couples, obviously, right? And so there are couples who really thrive with this idea of your career is the number one and its priority. And my career is secondary and I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with that. This is the way I want it. Right. And so for some couples that works really well. So that's not the thing that makes the difference. The thing that makes the difference is the extent to which the couples make these sort of arrangements or deals explicit or not. The extent to which they really talked about it. Did we actually sit down? Um, and really talk it through. What do I want? What do you want? Uh, what's non-negotiable to, to me? What's non-negotiable to you? Uh, how, how do we make this work? It, you know, so talking through, being really explicit, really clear with each other is the thing that really seems to make the difference in terms of how successful they are, but also how happy they are. Um, so hopefully that that made sense but yes talk Perfect. who yeah. who knew who knew right like the best advice is actually talk to your partner but um <laughs> I, I find that it, it's really interesting because a lot of the couples we interviewed you know of course you talk of course you talk a lot but quite often when you talk about um sort of deals or arrangements so to speak <clears throat> they're much more about the practical things right who picks up the kids and who does this and who does this task and that right so these kinds of deals or arrangements are talked about a lot, but the bigger picture ones of like, okay, how do we understand our dual career situation? How do we want to proceed? How do we, you know, how do we make decisions together? What matters to you? Well, many people don't actually explicitly really talk about these kinds of things. Um, and at least based on our research, uh, I'm here to suggest that that is often a very good idea. That makes perfect sense. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I can certainly live that one. Um, a question which, in a sense, spans both of those those sort of topics that we just covered: the, the IKI framework, the, the paradox within that framework, and also sort of uh, maybe different um, partner jobs. But this question is: How do you fulfil the missing value of status and/or respect for what you do? And then the relationship between that status respect and, and the, the pay scales that may or may not go with it. 
Right. <laughs> I mean, those are related, but they're different, right? So fulfilling a value that's rooted in respect and appreciation is one thing. Um, fulfilling a value that's about money is obviously different. And, you know, there might be some overlap, but I would say that they probably entail different strategies quite often. Um, what I would say is generally, I think the deeper you dig into the missing value and uh, the clearer you understand it, the more latitude you have in terms of figuring out ways to get it. Um, so I find that when I push my students to tell me, OK, what do you really mean by respect? What does that really mean to you? Um, I find that this is when um, it becomes really interesting and this is when we can get to um, the real answers that they're looking for. And then from there, taking the step to practically how do you get more of that into your life becomes much easier and you can be much more flexible and more creative, right? Very often people sort of get stuck at that level of, well, I want people to respect me. Okay, what does that actually mean? You want people to recognize that you have a certain expertise and that's what matters to you, or you want people to appreciate you for um, having visible success in the world, the kind of success that people tend to care about, like the cars and the money or whatnot, right? Or I want a particular set of people to respect me. I don't care about like people in general. I care about, I don't know, people I went to school with or wh whatever it is, right? Like the more clear and specific you can get about what do you actually mean what are you actually missing in terms of that value? The easier it is then to figure out, well, I can start my, I don't know, online club of playing chess and therefore sh showing everybody I care about to see that I'm smart, that I'm smart and get recognition that way, right? Or, or whatever it is, whatever that, you know, um, thing might be, right? But I, I think it's really important to not get stuck into just the surface level of understanding of what what's the value that you're missing. Um, and rather go a little bit beneath. I, I feel like people often do that um, with hobbies and activities that they love. It's like, I really, really miss basketball. I could have been a professional basketball player and I'm not, and I really miss that, right? If I push you to really think, it might just be that it's the actual activity of basketball that you really love and that you're missing and you want more of, in which case go and play basketball, right? But it might also be that what you're really missing is being part of a team and that atmosphere of like we're doing something together. So then go and try and get that, right? Or it might be that what you're missing is um, the feeling of again mastery, like you're doing an activity that you're really good at because you used to be really good at basketball. Great, then it's not necessarily about basketball. It's about anything that would give you the feeling of mastery, right? Um, so the clearer you can be about what's missing, the easier it's going to be to figure out how to get it. And I, sometimes, and I was I was stop talk, talking, I promise. Uh, but sometimes I I saw my students do that not just with activities, um, but also with people. You know the story of like the one who got away. I was with this person. We're not together anymore. And for years and years, I think about this person. Very often, it's not about the person. It's what the person represents and what they gave you. So again, it's not so much, and this is often why you get together again with the person it used to be and all of a sudden it's not the same and it's not, you know, feeding the value that you thought it was going to feed you and it comes with disappointment and all that kind of stuff. And it's just because you didn't dig like deeply enough to figure out what is it about, mm -hmm. you know, that label that you put on it, that activity, that person, that thing, what is it about it? that you're missing and you want more of because then you can be super creative about how you get more of that into your life, right? All right, I was I will stop talking. It is very right. difficult to stop me from talking when I talk about something I love. Um, <laughs> and it's much easier in the classroom because then it's a discussion and my students um, yeah. have a lot of interesting stuff to say, so. But it's yeah. fascinating listening to you. There's a, another question here which uh, I think plays into the aphorism that we very often hear that mm -hmm. Generation you know, Y, Generation Z are much more about experience and, and mm -hmm. property ownership and stuff like that. Um, so uh, this this question is, is there any evidence to show that making an impact is becoming more important to younger people now? Yes, yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so um, there is plenty of evidence um, that younger generations are 
more interested as, as I was saying generally what I and what I saw in my classes as well this idea of um, a legacy tends to become more important as people age however this seems to have flipped to some extent whereas young people um, are much more than their the previous generations much more so than parents and grandparents um, are focused from the beginning early on um, on how do I make the most impact? I mean, we've always uh, we've always heard this. Um, young people have always had the rhetoric of like, I want to change the world and make the world better and all of that. But that seems to be uh, significantly more driving career decisions uh, nowadays more than it used to be, which is why, for example, I was giving um, the example of a person I greatly admire, Sam Bankwell Fried, who is all of, I don't know, 28 or 29 years old um, and has donated literally billions of dollars uh, to charities and the whole impetus for the career and there, there are plenty of other people like him right um, who are extremely young and the whole idea behind their career is okay how do I like make the most money or do good in the most effective sort of a way um, the people who some of the same people actually uh, who um, founded um, this whole movement of effective altruism also have an organization called 80,000 hours I hope I'm not mistaken about that. I think that's right. Um, where they essentially give people career advice about how do you navigate your career in a way that allows you to do the most good? How do you use? You will have roughly 80,000 hours of work in our life, roughly. <laughs> um, and so the idea behind that organization is to advise people on how to best use or those 80,000 hours um, to do the most good. So yeah, that, that is... Um, that is a trend that I absolutely love and makes me feel very optimistic about the world. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, we certainly see it as well. I mean, partly as a consequence of demand, partly as a consequence mm -hmm. of our own intent. We, the mm -hmm. whole of the MBA program is much more about uh, responsible leadership and sustainable management now right. in every of the domains that we teach. And I think that that's being reflected in what students are demanding and, and quite rightly so. Right. Uh, Maybe we've got time for one one last question, which is quite specific. Okay. But, and this question is, is is on a specific point: daydreaming, daydreaming, uh -huh. which seems like an odd strategy it for dealing with trade-offs. So maybe you can explain a bit more about that. <laughs> it is an odd strategy. Yes. Um, usually, people there there are a lot of raised eyebrows in the classroom when I say, you know, if all else fails and you've got nothing else, um, just engage in a lot of daydreaming, um, <laughs> because it's so counterintuitive and it's very often perceived as in some ways, I guess, a waste of time. Uh, if you find yourself um, doing a lot of daydreaming and fantasizing, people think like, well, clearly that is not productive. Um, I am here to defend daydreaming. Uh, it can be enormously productive. Um, uh, so yeah, as I was saying, um, there's a lot of research. Um, uh, people are, uh, who are interested just look uh, for mental simulations. This is usually the label um, under which you'll find most of this research um, that looks at this idea of um, how important our mental life is uh, and how much it feeds us and how real it tends to feel to people. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of research that now has gone from just daydreaming into, for instance, um, the way people behave online and virtual reality and living parts of who you are um, in the virtual world. Uh, so to some extent, those things are related. But yeah, daydreaming is a, it's an interesting one because um, it relates to a lot of, I think, important ideas that are sort of bandied about and people don't quite understand them really well. Um, for example, a lot of my students come into the classroom thinking positive thinking is important. You have to think positively in order to achieve your uh, career goals and goals otherwise. And when I ask them about positive thinking, a lot of them what they mean is you have to visualize the future you desire, right? You have to see yourself as having achieved those goals. Essentially what they're talking about is daydreaming about having already achieved your goals, about being that person already, right? Like you see yourself being in that job or having that house or having that life that you that you want, right? Unfortunately, because of this research on mental simulations, we know, as I said earlier, to some extent your brain can't quite tell the difference between what you're daydreaming and fantasizing and what's actually real. And so to some extent you're already feeding off of the fantasy. And there's research to show that because of that, it makes you less likely 
to achieve your dreams, right? It actually makes you less likely to put in the effort and the time because you've already experienced uh, having achieved the dream to some extent. So it actually makes it less likely to achieve your dream, which is a whole you know can of worms that I very much enjoy opening in the classroom. Um, and so yeah, daydreaming is extremely um, good at allowing you to experience being uh, a certain kind of person or experience certain kinds of values that you don't get to experience in your real um, life. And so again, when everything else fails and you've got no other strategy to fulfill a missing value, go ahead, daydream about it, um, fully knowing that it is really good at fulfilling the missing value and also fully knowing that it's going to make you less likely to um, you know, pursue that missing value in real life, which is really interesting. If you find your employees, for example, daydreaming about leaving their job, um, there was one study that I remember reading about, uh, I think it was an investment bank where uh, vast majority of employees were daydreaming constantly about what life would be like when they quit their investment banking job. Um, again, have the number of millions and then get to do what they actually really wanted to do. And um, of course, th this is not something that any manager would want to hear. My employees are daydreaming about leaving the company. But my point is, let them daydream. It actually makes them less likely to leave. Like that is not that is not necessarily as bad as you think it is. Daydreaming is really, really um, a powerful thing um, if people can use it, you know, wisely. Very interesting, very interesting. And I'm sure lots of managers will find themselves challenged by that thought. But, yeah, but, yeah. I know. But brilliant. I know. <laughs> Kate's asked whether there's an, an optimal frequency for looking at the Ikigai framework throughout your career. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Gosh, these are these are great questions. Um, I mean, I would say there are natural points uh, that will prompt you to do so. Because again, you might come to these inflection points where um, uh, you know you're you're being considered for a promotion, or you're being you you need to move to some other part of the country or some other country entirely, or something happens in your life that makes you um, more prone to stop and reconsider. So then it's good to have some framework and it's good to have some guidance in terms of okay, how do I think my way through um, and navigate these kinds of decisions and be mentally prepared to deal with the consequences of whatever decision uh, I may be taking, right? So there are some points where I think it's just naturally going to happen. Um, I do encourage my students to do that. Um, the frequency that I recommend, and it's really just a guide, like it does not, it's not a recipe for anything, is just to give them a sense of, of um, what might be uh, good is roughly every year. I think roughly every year if you spend, you know, just 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 a little bit of time, like take an hour, maybe talk to someone because it's it might be more interesting when it's interactive um, and really like just stop, take a breath, take a step back. Like, OK, where am I? Where am I going? Do I need to adjust some settings <laughs> so as not to just go with the default wherever the wind of opportunity takes you and then you find yourself in a place where you're like, I don't know how I got here, um, right? And so I would say yearly, but again, that's mm, take it with a mountain of salt there. Like whatever works for you is is best. Brilliant, yeah. I, I think that, that that's very good advice. And, and as you say, a fairly regular cadence of looking at these things is a good thing. It's also a really useful thing to keep in your back pocket because life mm -hmm. has a habit of, of throwing serious inflection points into careers and yeah. you can find yourself quite adrift unless you've got a framework with which to think about next steps. Yeah, I think so. I think so, and I've seen it before, and we see it all the time. And it's, it, it, you know, in some ways it's it's fine. You can go through life and you can go through your career sort of adrift, um, and some people thrive like that, and that, that that's fine. Um, but I'm definitely of the um, school of thought of um, not that an, ex an unexamined life is not worth living. I wouldn't go that far, but I would go as far as saying an examined life tends to be better. A, a, a no wonder I'm an academic, right? Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, no wonder about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You think yeah. about things. <laughs> there's, a, there's a long question here for, from Akasha, which uh, can, I think we can we can sort of bring down to the nugget, which is uh, I think that we can imagine a scenario where, where you might find a job which seems to be ideal <laughs> on the framework, but there's extraneous things which don't fit. 
So it may be that it doesn't create great conditions for your you know, extended family or parents or whatever. So the question really is, are there any sorts of jobs that can't be fulfilled, if you like, by the four headings in the framework? Uh, the short answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, um, um, and uh, you know, to link it also to a previous question, uh, what doesn't this framework do? Well, of course, it's missing out on some things and it doesn't do some things, right? Um, so, for example, it doesn't really take into account or really fully flesh out um, how careers, how your career relates to the rest of your life, right? Um, so the idea for once, even if you get all of the four elements of the Ikigai, there's still things that might be missing and therefore not. it doesn't fit well with the rest of your life, as we were saying earlier. Um, and even like outside of that, independent of that question of fit, um, the Ikigai doesn't tackle what I believe to be and am well supported by research in saying, um, is the most important thing in terms of what constitutes a good life and what should drive your decisions generally, which is relationships. Um, the Ikigai doesn't talk about that, right? Like it, we're not, it sort of independently at some point touches on, but not really. Um, it, there, there's no focus on that. And I think um, that is, you know, if, if you were to boil down all of social research and say, what is the one advice you would give someone in terms of, how to live a good life what do we what do we know based on research that like if you had to boil it down and have one principle one guiding principle in life what would it be there is no doubt like the research is screaming as loudly as it can there is no doubt that that principle is the quality of your relationships determines the quality of your life this is what it is Right, and so yes, you can be in a situation where you have the bullseye of the ikigai a beauty of a job um, <laughs> But if your relationships are not good, uh, and you, if your if your close others, if your family, if your closest relationships are not good, it is not going to buy you all that much. Um, or 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 so research would have us believe. And again, it's 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 screaming pretty loudly. So I think we should believe it. Um, so yeah. So that that is one. Um, one aspect that's really important it is not captured by the ikigai and it is also the reason why in um the in my class we have one day where we get outside of the ikigai and all we talk about is relationships that is all we talk about for one, one entire day and i walk my students through all of the research that i want them to know um so that they can think about how they relate to the soul idea and how um they sort of put all the puzzle pieces together such that ideally the one that matters most and constitutes sort of the center of gravity uh, for the rest is uh, the piece about relationships. I think that that's brilliant and, and uh, in a sense it brings the whole thing together. <laughs> relationships cover all four of the areas in the Ikigai in some, in some ways. ways. In some ways, yes. That's why it can't be included yeah. in the framework because it's it's sort of Too big. Super yes, framework. yes, yes. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, uh, I tell you that that's been really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for, for enlightening all of us about the, the possibility. My pleasure. I, I I hope it's helpful and useful, and um, I hope I it is odd to just speak into a computer. Um, it's a different and weird sort of format, but I'm hoping that I get to actually see some of you out there who are listening. <laughs> I hope that I get to see some of you in 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 the classroom. Well, that's great, and and we all we all hope the same. And maybe maybe that's a good segue to uh, allow me to introduce uh, our audience to Becky Gallagher, who um, who you'll meet as well if you actually go through the application process. And we'll ask Becky to uh, tell us a little bit more about the program, about how you can apply for the program, and obviously give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have about the the application recruitment process for our MBAs. So uh, without further ado, let me hand over to Becky. Hi, thanks, Don. Um, that's great. And, and thanks, Atilia, for, for that amazing masterclass. I've learnt loads, so I might have to come knocking on your door. <laughs> um, so um, thank you, everyone, for uh, staying on the call. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, I'm here just to tell you a little bit about the, the MBA programmes that we run. So we have two MBA programmes. We have the full-time 12-month programme, and we have the executive part-time programme, which is 
run over two years um, and that's uh, three days every month on campus here in Bath. Um, both programmes are in person, uh, which I'm, I'm very pleased to say um, with the, you know, obviously what's been going on recently. We have um, maintained our in-person presence. The universities work very closely uh, with us and with our students and our staff to make sure everyone's been safe and feels comfortable with that in-person presence. But we do um, really believe that particularly in MBA, it's really important that you're doing this face to face in the classroom. Um, so so that's where we are still planning to be. Um, our classes are quite small. They're quite boutique. Um, we have up to 50 students on the full time programme and around 20 students on our executive part time programme. Um, so what it does mean is that you can't hide anywhere in the classroom. Um, so, so that's great for, for our, our academics working with you. They get to know you really well. And um, as you've found out from Matilia, she draws lots of stories from past students, which is really great to hear. And um, so you can't hide, but equally you have a voice and you are listened to. Um, and uh, we very much want people who come with those opinions, who can who can talk about their experiences, who are willing to sort of participate in um, in sort of active engagement in the classroom. And um, so our classes are small. Um, we have a range of industry backgrounds that people come from. So, it, you know, I think on the full time programme, we've got something like 20 different industry backgrounds. We've probably got um, maybe eight to 10 generally on our executive programme. So, you know, we, we don't particularly mind your industry background in that sense. Um, so do come with all those experiences. What is great about it is that when you actually join our cohort, um, you are sitting in a class with people who are not like you. They haven't got the same experiences. Um, they they may have different industry backgrounds. They might have different career goals or they may think they have different career goals. Who knows? Um, that might change as, as you go through the, the programme with us. Um, different nationalities we have between 14 to 20 different uh, nationalities on the full time programme. Um, so it's a real mix of our of our class, um, different uh, range of experience in years as well. So again, on the full time programme, generally speaking, people tend to be around the sort of 30 year old mark. So you can see that people have have at least we demand at least three years experience. Um, quite often people will come with more like four or five years experience um, and on the executive average age is around sort of mid 40s. So it tends to be people more in sort of middle to senior management positions. Um, and again, they're bringing maybe more like 10 years experience with them. Um, so I've noticed a question in the chat. Great, please, please put any questions in there. Um, what makes our programme different? Um, so our, our full time programme is very, very heavily project based. So what you learn in the classroom is always then backed up with um, examples from our academics such as Atilia, who, who might bring in um, real uh, case studies that she's conducted, but also we bring in business uh, contacts who will come up with projects which are directly related to the modules you've just been learning about. So you'll learn it in theory in the classroom, you'll have time to practice in the classroom and then you'll have a client brief. So you will be working directly with the client to actually tease out the project that they're proposing that you solve or you come up with some solutions to. Um, and then quite often you will then present back both to the client, but also to your peers in the class. So you'll get that very critical analysis from everyone around you who's involved in that process. So it's highly, highly practical, which means that when you go into your first job, you've tried and tested, uh, you've made your mistakes, uh, you will likely make more mistakes, but at least you'll make them knowing where you're making those mistakes. So it's a very safe environment from that respect. So you really are trying things out um, with the support of people around you before you go into your um, your actual career in the future. Um, so so our program is very, very practical. Um, I would say that's the sort of one of the driving forces behind us we have you'll see on the website we have the multi-project suite which is a series of four different projects coming towards the tail end of the program so we don't do a final dissertation um 
we feel that although it's an academic program, actually what you're learning is how to how to apply it into your career in the future. So it is very much um, designed in that way. So it's, it's very project led. So those that's some of the way our, our programs different. Again, the website has lots and lots of information. I'm just going to switch on to some other questions so we don't lose anything. Um, so yes, we are currently teaching face to face. Uh, we do intend to continue doing that. You know, part of the the experience is coming in, networking, making those relationships um, through the whole of the admissions process. Whilst your sort of when, once your offer has been made to you, we encourage you to start networking with the other offer holders. So by the time you come into the classroom, you're already quite comfortable with quite a few of your classmates. Um, and I know that this past year, some of the MBA students uh, all quarantined together. So when they again, they came on the programme, they'd already had that shared experience. So we very much try to facilitate that networking at a very early stage before you even come to us. Um, so yes, we are teaching face to face. Um, so, um, and, and yeah, so other ways that you connect, um, you can connect with our current students, um, you can use LinkedIn, uh, you can contact us directly and we can put you in touch with current students. Um, uh, the university has a platform called UniBuddy and you can go on that. We have two of our current MBA students currently who are ambassadors for us, um, so you can do an online virtual chat with them um, and we have a wide, wide alumni network, both for the MBA programmes, but also um, from the university itself, because part of making your choice of which university to come to has to be the program, the delivery, the career outcomes, etc. But it's also about where you're living. You're going to be living in Bath, hopefully, for, you know, if you're coming on the full time program, you're coming here for 12 months, 12 months plus if you do an internship and if you get a permanent job here. So it's really important that you think very carefully about the environment that you're coming into. Um, you can do lots of research on Bath. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it sells itself. Um, you'll have seen it in various films. Uh, so it, it's it's a great place to come and study. I think it's important to note that it's, it's um, quite a small city and it's surrounded by hills. So to get out into nature, it's very, very easy. Now, that suits the people who come to our class, but it is something to think about when you're choosing which uh, university you're going to apply to, because it is, a, you know, it is an important part um, of, of your environmental well-being when you, whilst you're here. Um, so that's that's just some of the sort of highlights I wanted to share with you. Um, there's no other questions coming in. Um, so if anyone has anything, please put something in the Q&A. You can reach out to me individually. We, we can uh, have a one to one at any stage. So the admissions process would normally be that I would invite you to meet up with me first before you put your application in. Um, we find that's quite a nice way to have that initial touch with me. Um, and then we'd invite you to put your application in. Once that's assessed, you would then be invited to an interview, which is done um, through teams um, and then we will talk you through the next stages of the process. Well, that's great, thanks Becky. Um, there is a question there which I don't know whether we've addressed but, but which says what common traits do successful students in the program tend to share and which I, I guess there'd be different traits for the exec program versus the full-time program but but maybe you can talk to that a little bit. Yeah yeah no that's a great question and, and it's one that that people are very interested in actually because if you're making this application you want to know that what we're looking for is actually what you're also looking for whether you're delivering it in a very um, soft way at the moment but want to enhance it you know that's a, that's the sort of thing that we can pull out for you so really what we're looking for are people who are very proactive who are very engaged and this goes across both programs people who have that global awareness so you're you're thinking not just about your industry or your country or your particular environment, but actually people who are able to talk in a much more holistic way. Um, we um, want you to be inspiring. We want you to bring your experiences in um, and share those experiences to inspire the people around you. Um, we look for people who are aspirational. Now that could be that you already know where your career is going, particularly on the executive side, that quite often happens more that you know where you're going and you just need help to get there. Um, but 
that that drive um, and that willingness to learn and listen, I think, is really key for us because you'll come in with with your experiences, potentially your own preconceptions about things. And but only by listening and learning through the experience on the programme will you potentially learn to become a more broader um, person in the, in the future. So so um, yeah, we we will make sure that you are emotionally intelligent by the time you finish with us. That you know um, what a strategy looks like and how to ask the right questions when you're confronted with a strategy. Uh, so so those are some of the key key skills I suppose that we'd be looking for. Excellent. Is it um, a question here? Just a specific thing about about visas. Um, so a questioner from from Hong Kong, um, who obviously would need to apply for a student visa for full time study, can then stay in the UK for two years after graduation whilst looking for jobs. Uh, but the question is really, if if applying for part time study, would that visa still be valid to stay in the UK for two years after graduation? Ah, uh, that is a very interesting question. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, to be honest, on the executive part time program, normally, especially with travel restrictions at the moment, you would probably need to be based in the UK permanently for, for the two year program. So I'm not quite sure, you know, whether that's your intention or not um, to do that. But that would that would necessitate a different type of visa yet again, because obviously it'd be part time study with presumably some sort of um, work that you'd be doing over here. So it would be linked to an employer as well. So that's quite a specific question that we're very happy to advise about offline. It's, it's probably the best way there. And we do have, have specialists in the university who, who are dedicated to answering visa questions and helping students with those issues. Absolutely, and we do, um, although we help. Um, we're not trained experts in 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 visas, so we are that we we do help put students in touch with the right people within the university. Yes, and that's something to note with our with our admissions process. You know, as soon as you are made an offer with us, we do help you with all the practicalities, whether that's accommodation, visa, you know, getting to Bath, all of those things. Um, you know, we're here to help, and that that's what our our job is for that time to get you over and into Bath um, successfully. Great. And one, one last question before we wrap this session up, which maybe encompasses everything that you've just talked about, which is um, how can I make my application stronger? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess listen to everything that uh, we've been talking about. It's I think the important thing is just to be yourself. Um, you know, we we will hand pick our top 50 students um, and we are looking for the top 50 students who are going to make the most impact in the classroom and who we also feel we can make the most impact to them as well. It's a two way thing. Um, so when you're selecting your universities, consider that. Make sure you're reaching out to um, current students, to alumni to get a flavour for the institution you're applying for. Um, but I, and I think yeah, reach out to me first probably um, and have that initial chat so that we can make sure that what we have to deliver is exactly what you're going for. But yeah, be yourself, come with lots of ideas, be open minded, be curious. Um, and, and that's what we like on the programme. Brilliant. Becky, many, many thanks indeed. So I think it's probably time to, to wrap this up. We've just got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so my my huge thanks to both you, Becky, and to Atelier for, for a fascinating session. Uh, for those of you in the audience, there will be a questionnaire which comes to you asking for feedback on this session. So we'd be very grateful to hear from you, whether it's, you know, whether it's positive or negative. Critical thinking is really valuable, so we want to improve these all the time. You'll also get a link to the recording so you can see it again if you want. Um, and if you haven't been able to attend in person, then and welcome to the recording. You'll get a link to Becky so that you can ask her questions directly of anything. Um, so hopefully we'll cover off all the bases. So it only remains to me to, to say thank you once again. And thanks also to the team who put these sessions together. It takes quite a lot of work in the background to, to provide this stuff. So many thanks to the team, to Professor Obadaru, to Becky Gallagher. And that's it from us. Thank you for attending.